The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. I'm Tony Marino, and today we're going to be tearing down the Famicom Disk System. So, Famicom Disk System, what the heck is this thing? Well, came out in 1986 as an extension of the Famicom, which many of you know is the Japanese version of the NES. Like the name implies, it used floppy disks instead of cartridges, which means it could store a lot more data, but it also allowed for features like saving before battery backups were a thing. Eventually, they partnered with Sharp Corporation to release a model known as the Twin Famicom, which had the disk system already built in. Sadly, we never got the unit here in the West, but a lot of the more popular games ended up getting ported to the NES anyway. Alright, so let's take a look at what comes in the box. Now, if you can't read Japanese, that's okay. All it basically says is what the contents are. It says that it's a set, and that it comes with the disk drive, the RAM adapter, and an RF extension cord. Mine doesn't come with the RF extension cord, but it's 2018, so I'm not really going to lose sleep over that. So here is the disk drive itself in all of its glory. It comes with this little protection sleeve to keep dust and dirt out. Here is... The RAM adapter, which we'll be hooking up to the actual Famicom itself. And these. These don't actually come with the set, but I need these. These are C batteries. I know, I didn't think anything used them anymore either. And they probably don't, but this is from 1986, so we need six of them. So I want to take apart this RAM adapter first because it's kind of the brains of the whole unit. The point of it is basically to replicate the functionality of a game cartridge, which is why it's shaped like one, uh, and why it plugs into the cartridge slot. That would make the most sense, right? Uh, the processor, the brains of the whole unit is inside of this thing. That's what drives the disk drive itself. It also has the BIOS, the system BIOS on there, and uh, acts as a floppy disk controller. And uh, there's some memory chips on here as well that act the same way as ones that you would find on a cartridge. We'll talk about that in a second. And check this out. It looks like there's like a little, um, some sort of expand expansion port on the side? I don't know what that's for. We'll have to uh, take a look at that. Let's take a look at these chips here. Uh, the main one that's going to be of interest to us is the processor. That is the Rico 2C33A. Like I mentioned earlier, it acts as a floppy disk controller. It contains the BIOS. And the third thing that it does, which I think is really cool, is it expands the sound hardware capabilities of the Famicom. There were game cartridges in Japan which could also do this. They had their own custom chipsets that were installed into the cartridges that were able to expand the sound capabilities. Uh, Castlevania 3, for example, went really nuts with this, but I believe this was the first time that Nintendo themselves ever did this. So what they ended up doing was adding one additional sound channel into the mix, and that was a wavetable synthesizer. Now to me, I found this really interesting because it looks like Nintendo actually really liked the idea of using wavetable synthesis. Uh, it wasn't only used in the Famicom Disk System, but they also continued to use it for Channel 3 of the Game Boy, for all of the sound channels in the Virtual Boy. Even the Wonderswan used it. That's not a Nintendo system, but Gunpei Yokoi, the inventor of the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy, did go on to create that after his tenure at Nintendo. So there you go. I guess he must have really liked it. Now let's take a look at some of the other chips that are on this board. So over here we've got 32K of DRAM, dynamic RAM, and that is used to store the program data from the floppy disk and load it into the system, basically like you would with a cartridge. So the way a normal game cartridge would work is in their most simple form, there would be two ROM chips, one containing graphics data and the other containing program data. Now, since disk system games obviously store all of this data onto floppy disks, programming graphics data is instead loaded dynamically into RAM chips instead of ROM chips. And the system reads all of this data off of these RAM chips like they would normally with the ROM chips. Which is why if we look over here, we have 8K of SRAM, static RAM, used to store graphical data loaded from the disk system. I think this is one of the only systems that they made that used standard Phillips head screws. I believe this, the Famicom itself, and the NES were the only ones to do that. After that, it was all tri-rings or those god-awful security screws. Those were a nightmare for anybody who wanted to actually take these things apart. All right, let's open this sucker up. It's like there's even more screws on the inside that we gotta... Okay, these two right here go to the... holding the battery compartment in place, looks like. 
All right, I can, when you're taking this apart, you wanna pull this little ribbon cable right here is what's holding the power board in place. So we gotta uh, pluck that out and uh, we'll be in good shape. So let's take a look at this power board that I just removed. As you can see down there at the bottom, it says FMD Power 05. That's because there were actually five different revisions of this board, sort of. <laughs> Let me explain. So each revision that was made of this board is exactly the same and has the exact same functionality. Um, the only difference was how it implemented uh, the level of copy protection. Version one and two of the board had absolutely no copyright protection. That version was awesome. Version 3 of the board, as well as a later revision of 2, had this little breakout daughter board type deal going on. All you had to do was just remove it from the connector and you were done. That version was also awesome. Version 4 and 5 is where it gets a little bit tricky. They actually put the ASIC on the board now, so you have to run some wires to bypass it. Version 4 and 5 basically work the same way, it's just that the hack that we have to do to disable the copyright protection is just in slightly different places. So on version 5, right here we have this little 4-bit chip down over here and this chip is actually really interesting to me because from what I can tell from my research it is really similar if not possibly identical to the CIC chip found in the NES. The CIC chip of course is the lockout chip that was used to prevent people from playing unauthorized or pirated video games of course. It was also the chip that caused many people to have blinking screens for days and just in general caused a ton of headaches. A lot of people would go ahead and disable this chip on their NES by introducing a voltage spike. I don't really like doing that, so we're gonna go and disable it a different way. So here's the completed hack. I basically had to run two wires coming down from the connection for the RAM adapter all the way down to the uh, disk drive header right down there. I also removed two jumpers and cut the traces that you see are cut. Yep, we have ourselves a disabled security chip. Now, if this thing was going to give us any headaches, it is not going to do so anymore. It's a little hard to see this, but uh, you can see the words Nintendo are embedded into the plastic here on the back of the drive door. That's because uh, the discs themselves had the word Nintendo engraved into them. The letters here are all at different heights, and I guess that was because it was some sort of security measure to uh, keep people from making unauthorized discs. But uh, all I had to do was unscrew the drive door. It was just two screws, and I took the whole thing off. So uh, not a very good security measure. Might want to rethink that one next time. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so right here, we're looking at the dreaded disk drive. And I say dreaded because this is the point of failure that most people experience, and it is a nightmare to replace the belt on this thing. You can see right here the belt that's installed is a nice clear silicone based one. That's a replacement belt. I actually installed that one myself. The original one is this black rubber one that tends to deteriorate over time. It will melt actually, <laughs> eventually disintegrate and just get stuck to literally everything inside of here. It'll get stuck to the drive spindle. It'll get stuck to the electronics. It is gooey, it is sticky, and you do not want to deal with it. But if you do have to deal with it like I did, you can basically end up just using some rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip. That'll make short work of it, but you're still gonna have to put some elbow grease into it. You're gonna go through about 100 of these things, and like I said, it's gonna be a sticky mess. But with a little bit of effort, you can clean yours out too. One thing to keep in mind about this belt is that this triangle right here actually comes off. You have to remove it, and it has to be removed in order to insert the new belt because uh, the belt actually goes around one of these tension rods right here. Uh, it's a bit tricky and you don't get a lot of slack with the belt, but if you use some tweezers like I did, uh, you should be able to uh, pull it around the spindle correctly and then reinstall the tension rod by turning it into place. So just keep that in mind. It is a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, so <laughs> instead we're just going to go and take a look at this logic board right here. That uh, seems like a good time. There's a lot of mechanical little switches on this thing that I'm guessing have to do with how the drive uh, must auto home itself. You know, when, when certain mechanical components go as far, basically, as they intend for it to go, they'll activate these switches and that'll tell it, hey, stop moving, don't go any further than this. So this is the FD7201P. Its main purpose, from what I can tell, was to convert the digital signals coming from the RAM adapter into an analog signal that the mechanical components could understand. Simple enough, you would think, but Nintendo, of course, had to have released another revision which had an additional stage of logic on it which prevented you from being able to rewrite the entire disc. Thankfully, we don't have to deal with that. Five. 
Push start. All right, we push start. Let's do it. New game. Service data? What is that? Message from me. I think this is going to be a very text-heavy game, isn't it? Oh, new game. Okay, what's my name? All right, we're going to enter my name. Okay. It says Tony. You're just going to have to take my word for it. Oh! Okay, it wants me to flip the... All right, flipping it over to side B. Interesting. Wow. That, that's actually kind of interesting. I didn't... Wow! So the actual game is on the B side and the intro slash name entry data is on the A side? I don't know how this... What? Don't use your disc games next to your thermos or your... Toaster? So, that was the Famicom Disk System Teardown. Have you ever tried taking apart or modifying a console yourself? What challenges did you run into? Let us know in the comments below or on the Element 14 community.